I arrived in Orlando Friday night and was greeted by the woman at the front desk of the hotel with the question, are you with the Liberty Group? And my answer came without even a moment's hesitation, yes, I am. I'm with the Liberty Group. I'm with those who bear the name Christian. And we have been set free in Jesus Christ. And I stand with you for authentic freedom at an urgent time in this nation's history. Yes, we have differing theological positions on some important issues, and we don't pretend we don't. However, we share a common commitment to Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and a common understanding that this is an urgent moment in human history. And to those to whom much is given, much more will be required. We are called into this hour. This is our hour, our moment, and we are called together. We know that when a society begins to decline because it embraces the idea that there is nothing that is true, nothing that can be known by all and form a common ground for our life together, it is losing freedom. Freedom can never be realized, nor can it flourish, unless it is exercised in reference to the truth and to what is good. You see, the image of God Reverend Rodriguez was so good on this last night. The Imago Dei within each of us, one aspect of it that is so clear is our capacity to choose. Our freedom. Now, yes, that freedom's been fractured by sin, but in Jesus Christ, it's set free. And we are called to exercise our freedom to choose what is true and what is good. And as a nation, we've lost that. We've lost our moral compass and as a result, we're losing our soul. We have a counterfeit notion of freedom. And freedom needs to be set free. And it's going to be Christians who follow the one who is the way, the truth, and the life that help this nation to once again discover authentic freedom. Even during the last election, the very notion that you can separate out economic issues and international issues and social issues reveals the problem. There's got to be a moral foundation to a free society. And every single issue finds its roots in that moral foundation. Now, those of us who make this claim that there's a moral foundation to a free society, those of us who are Christians do not stand alone in it. Such a claim simply acknowledges the existence of a natural moral law that binds us together, that's written on our heart. And that concept has launched great civilizations. That's what we've lost in this nation. Without a natural moral law, we can no longer govern ourselves. And our positive law, our civil law, loses its anchor. And we devolve into anarchy. The truth is that there is such a thing as truth. And that is the struggle we face in this hour. We suffer under relativism, this philosophical notion that your truth is as good as your truth, as as good as your truth, and therefore there is no truth. And that is the absolute antithesis to the Christian claim. The Christian claim is there is truth, it can be known, and it's been fully revealed in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. My friends, the struggle we face in this hour demands that we not retreat from the culture. But it also requires that we understand the challenges we face. The Christian notion of freedom is not just a freedom from, it's a freedom for responsible living and virtuous living. It's a freedom which recognizes our obligation to one another in solidarity. It's a freedom that brings with us obligations to care for one another. We are living in an age which has lost its way. It's lost its soul. And we are called to restore it. Now, what I'd like to share with you today is a little historical perspective. We can tend to think that the times in which we live are the most difficult times Christians have ever faced. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
Christians have faced these times before. In fact, these are precisely the times we're sent into, and we're called to transform them from within. So step back with me for a moment, if you will, to the year 125 to 150 AD. The nascent church that had responded to the message and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ took him seriously and was beginning to go out into all the world and was facing, as a result, tremendous persecution. But they continued their work because they knew there was no alternative. They needed to be obedient to the one who called them to proclaim the way, the truth, and the life. I want to read to you a short portion of a letter that was written to a pagan inquirer named Diogenetus. We still have this letter. Listen to these words. He's asking this Christian, we're not sure of his name, we think it was Mattathus, how Christians view the world and how they live in the world. And so the Christian writes back, Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or custom. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. Their teaching is not based upon reveries inspired by the curiosity of men. Unlike some other people, they champion no purely human doctrine. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs of whatever city they happen to be living in, whether it is Greek or foreign. And yet there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. They play their full role as citizens, but labor under all the disabilities of aliens. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. Like others, they marry and have children, but they do not expose them. They share their meals, but not their wives. Now, let me stop there for a second. They do not expose them. You see, already, the nations that Christians were going into to proclaim the gospel were practicing primitive forms of abortion, and worse yet, infant exposure. After the baby was born, if you didn't want him or her, you put him out on a rock outside the city to be picked up by slave traders or eaten by birds of prey. And the Christians rejected this. And notice the line, they share their meals, but not their wives. Rampant sexual immorality was a part of the culture they were called into to transform it from within. He goes on, they live in the flesh, but they're not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon the earth, but they are citizens of heaven. Obedient to the laws, they yet live on a level that transcends the law. Christians love all men, but all men persecute them. Condemned because they are not understood, they're put to death, but raised to life again. They live in poverty, but enrich many. They're totally destitute, but possess an abundance of everything. They suffer dishonor, but that is their glory. They are defamed, but vindicated. Because I'm running out of time, I'm going to have to cut this short. This is the line. To speak in general terms, we may say that the Christian is to the world what the soul is to the body. What the Christian is to the world is what the soul is to the body. We are called to be the soul of the world. And the writer goes on to say that the soul animates, elevates, transforms the body. Of course, this is very much in keeping with the teacher of the master, who told us we were to be the yeast and the leaven that transformed the loaf. Christians belong in the world because God still loves the world so much that he sends his only son. And that son continues his work through you and me. So we cannot retreat from the culture. In fact, we are called to transform it and to once again give it life. The early church was sent into cultures very much like our own. They thought they were advanced in the light of the arts and sciences of this day. But those cultures also practiced primitive forms of abortion and exposure. This letter and other manuscripts from that period of time show us that what we're facing in the third millennium is very much like what Christians faced in the first millennium. Many of the gods and goddesses of the old pagan regimes promoted lives of selfish excess, homosexual practice, hedonism masquerading as freedom. The myths they told had their own pagan gods acting in much the same way. 
Well, my friends, the Western culture has slipped through secularism into a new paganism. The myths and the tributes and the statues are different, but the reality isn't. And contemporary paganism, like the paganism of old, is not the path to authentic freedom, but to misery. Now, the Christians did not change their message to the culture, but they changed the culture through their message. They transformed it. And they demonstrated through compelling lifestyles another way of living. Remember, until Antioch, they were called the way. It was in Antioch they were first called Christians. And their way of life attracted people. They didn't know why at first, but they were drawn. It will attract people in our day and age as well, if we live it. It was Christianity that taught such novel concepts as the dignity of every human person and their equality before the one God. It was Christians who proclaimed the dignity of women, the dignity of chaste marriage, the sanctity of the family. It was Christianity that introduced the understanding of freedom, not simply as a freedom from, but a freedom for, living responsibly and with integrity and with virtue. And over time, what happened? We know what happened. Christianity spread. Now, yes, blood was shed, and great suffering ensued. But the blood of the martyrs became the seed of the church. And those cultures that rejected the Christians became Christian. It can happen in our age as well. I want to suggest something. I hear a lot that we're living in a post-Christian age. I suggest we're living in a pre-Christian age. And that in a lot of ways, we would be a lot better off if we woke up tomorrow morning and decided we're living in a new missionary age. Let's look around at this culture. Let's ask the Lord to give us the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. And let's go out and proclaim the gospel through our compelling lifestyle, through the witness of our words, and let's see what he can do. And we know what he can do, exactly what he did in the first millennium, exactly what he did in the third, second millennium, he will do in the third millennium, if we will respond to the invitation. Now, I want to suggest, and I love this nation, I want to suggest that we begin seeing that our role as Christians in this nation is, yes, we're Americans. And yes, we recognize that the founders of this nation had an understanding of authentic freedom. And the Declaration reveals these first principles that rights come from God and, and these wonderful truths. But they came out of the legacy of Western Christianity. And we need to learn our history, learn from it, and learn to repeat it. America needs us right now. She has lost her soul. And we are called to be the soul of the world. The founders of this nation understood that there was a natural law. They understood that rights were, in fact, inalienable and endowed upon us from a creator, not given to us by a civil government. We have a lot of work to do, but it is work that must be done, and we are the ones called to do it. There are four pillars I want to end with that I think we need to focus on as we find a way to collaborate. One is life. Life. The first human right. The dignity of every human life from conception to natural death is not just an issue. It's the lens through which we view every single issue. And we need to be a people who defend life. Marriage and the family founded upon it. No room for compromise. It is written in, in fact, the order of the universe because marriage is God's plan for the whole human race. And family is the first society, the first church, the first school, the first educating institution. And without it, there can be no truly just society. We need to defend marriage and family. And if, in fact, sadly, over the next year or two, we see that the courts rule against the truth about marriage. That doesn't change how we live the truth about marriage because truth doesn't change. Cultures may, for good or for bad, and it's only a matter of time before we bring the culture to the real truth about marriage. That's what happened in the first millennium. In fact, there was a book written in 1996 by a sociologist named Rodney Stark, and he studied what happened. 
And what happened was the pagan cultures began to be converted not only by the words, but by the witness of Christians. Pagan men wanted to marry Christian women. Why? They'd be faithful and they wouldn't put their babies out on rocks. And as the Christians began to deal with the plagues of the age, others were fleeing cities, Christians were going within. And over time, the culture became Christianized. Life, family, authentic human freedom. And religious freedom as the first freedom. We cannot allow the church to be silenced. And we cannot buy this notion that every one of our positions is religious, therefore it needs to be kept behind the church wall. The truth of the matter is, Christianity may be profoundly personal, but it is not private. It is public. And the truth we offer to the culture is the only truth that will set free. So we need to stand for freedom. Finally, we need to stand together in solidarity with one another and for the sake of the world. And yes, we don't like big government, but we are not anti-government. We want to proclaim the Christian contribution, which is that government begins in the home and any other governing beyond that must first defer to it. I see that I've run over my time. I don't want to have somebody pull me off the stage with a cane, but thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the Liberty Group, and I stand with Liberty. God bless you all. Thank you.